and uh, it's 8.30 on my computer. So I think we will start if that's all right with everybody. Everybody looks ready. We'll get this morning off to a good start. So my name is Jessica Holmes and I'm currently serving as the interim chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. Today is day four of our Green Mountain Care Board hospital budget review process. Week two, but day four. So we'll be hearing from Rutland Regional Medical Center this morning and we'll hear from Mount Escutney Hospital and Health Center this afternoon. Um, just as a quick reminder, I've been saying this at the beginning of every day, but for us to arrive at decisions for each hospital's budget, we look to our statute, we look to our hospital budget rule for guiding principles. Just as a reminder, we're going to have to balance several often competing factors, the need to slow you know, the growth in healthcare expenditures, while also trying to ensure that our hospitals have the resources that they're going to need to recruit and retain healthcare workers and also to provide the high quality care that we expect in our communities. So as we're attempting to balance cost containment, access quality, and health system sustainability, we're gonna to have to be mindful of this year's unique circumstances and the significant headwinds that we're facing. Historically high inflation rates, workforce shortages, provider burnout, and the continuing impacts of the pandemic. So both nationally and in Vermont, hospitals are facing unprecedented financial challenges as are businesses, families, and individuals. So over the next few weeks, our immediate task is obviously going to be to set these fiscal year 23 hospital budgets for the 14 community hospitals that we regulate. But I want to remind everyone that the board is working closely with the Agency of Human Services to begin the work outlined in Act 167, which aims to move us closer to a sustainable hospital system that will ensure Vermonters have access to high quality affordable care. And that work is going to involve extensive data analysis and hospital and community engagement, but the end result will hopefully be a more sustainable path forward. Um, as we turn back to the hearing today, I want to extend a thank you to both the Rutland team and the Mount Escutney teams for the time and effort that they've taken to submit the documents for our review. It, it will be a really interesting and informative day. Uh, a few housekeeping notes about the hearings today. This presentation is a public meeting. It's being recorded and transcribed, so there will be a publicly available record. If a hospital's leadership team believes that there is some confidential information that the Green Mountain Care Board should consider, either as part of the hospital's presentation or in response to board or staff questions or HCA questions, please alert us before responding if needed. We can go into an executive session and review confidential information from hospitals. Executive sessions would have to be limited in scope as provided by the open meeting law and limited to just that information such as contracts and information that would be deemed confidential under the Public Records Act. So if an issue of possible confidentiality arises, I will call on the board's legal counsel to determine the scope of what could be discussed in executive session and if deemed appropriate and at the appropriate time, I would then ask a board member for a motion to go into executive session. Well, with that, I see all the board members, right? I saw Tom there a second ago. Tom Walsh, you're here, right? Yes. Okay, here. perfect. Um, and court reporters are on and the Escutney team is on. So I think we're ready to go. I hope everybody had a wonderful lunch and a little rest. Um, and at this point, Dr. Paris, I think I will turn it over to you and Dave, and then we look forward to hearing your uh, budget submission. If you have slides, I know you do. You can just load them up now. Oh, okay, sorry, let me do that. I wasn't sure who was going to be projecting. So let me bring those up. Jessica, uh, Hi, sorry, to... Does, yeah, go ahead, Russ. I think you're going to say huh. what I was going to say. Oh, shoot. Uh, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. I forgot. Happy... I in. Yes. Thank yeah. you, Russ. <laughs> happy, to, happy to swear everyone in. Um, uh, Dr. Paris, who is uh, presenting for the Mount Escutney team? Uh, myself, uh, Joseph Paris, and Dave Sandville are CFO. Great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll Swear you both in if you could raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause no under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. We do. Great. Uh, thank you. You're sworn in and. Um, Perfect. Thank you, Russ. Almost forgot that important thing. And I'm going to hold all board questions until the end of your presentation, just so that you can go through it without interruption. Okay. And can folks 
see that slide? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so uh, thanks uh, for having us, uh, board members, as well as uh, members of the, of the public. Um, God, I wanna say this is my ninth time um, between being CMO and then CMO slash CEO um, uh, presenting the budget uh, along with uh, my, my partner, uh, David Sandville. Uh, I do wanna make a quick note uh, that our controller, Teresa Tabor, who's, who's usually presenting with us, um, is uh, unfortunately leaving our, our finance team, our well-oiled uh, finance team. Uh, uh, I won't say at my suggestion, but at least I planted the seed uh, to take a, a, a position in the western slope of, of Colorado. Um, so normally I'd say she's off to greener pastures, but it's high desert and it's... Uh, Sandy and Rocky out there, but we're going to miss Teresa. She's done a lot of great service for us and has helped us for many years, this year included in, in presenting the budget. So we will go through uh, the agenda as uh, listed here. We have a lot of slides. We'll try to move through them um, efficiently. Uh, I know uh, uh, board member Holmes just said they're going to hold questions, but if anything pops out or seems odd, please uh, flag me down and uh, I will uh, uh, stop there. I, I seem to only be able to see my own slides on the screen, so you'll have to pop in audibly um, if there's something you'd like clarification on. Uh, we'll go through the overview. So our, our, our mission is to improve the lives of those we serve. That's been a, a, a simple uh, and succinct uh, mission statement for uh, many years here. We often do choose um, pictures when we are marketing ourselves that focus on our rehab presence. That really is uh, a prime focus for us. We do have the 10 bed acute rehab in addition to the 25 bed critical access hospital. Our rehab is the, uh, I believe the only CARF accredited uh, acute rehabilitation facility uh, in Vermont. And uh, uh, something we're very, we're proud of, and we continue to care for hundreds of post-acute patients from Dartmouth-Hitchcock and from around New England uh, yearly. Uh, this was especially pronounced during the pandemic when we were receiving rehab and post-acute patients from all over New England and New York um, and uh, even Pennsylvania. Our org chart remains uh, unchanged. I do want to just make a quick comment. We continue to run our historic homes of Runnymede, which is an assisted living facility in downtown Windsor. Uh, we had unsuccessfully applied for uh, some congressional earmark funding to help renovate and put some much needed infrastructure investment into that uh, facility, but we were unsuccessful there. We have uh, uh, kept Dr. that- Harris? Oh yeah. Sorry. Can I just interrupt you for a quick second? Yeah. For me, at least, your slides are not advancing. Oh, no. So I'm not okay. sure if others are experiencing that as well, but I just thought I would check in. Is it is it advancing for other people? No. Okay. Did you say so yes or no? I see the Green Mountain Care Board budget presentation, the very first slide on my screen. Huh. Okay. Let's go back here. And I was going to say, if Kara, you want to help in any way, I know... It's it's also not in slide form. I wonder if that's part of the issue. Oh, that may be part of it. Hold on. Okay, let's try this. You want to go see who's here? You want to go see? And I'm just going to ask everybody to put their microphones on mute. Okay. Tells me that I'm tells me that I'm sharing. Uh, let's go back here. Stop sharing. Try this again. Sorry about that. Do not worry. This happens from time to time. Yeah. Open share tray. You guys use Teams and we use WebEx, both of which are awful. <laughs> Agreed. Right. Let's try this. It should be noted that Joe is the more competent of the two users oh. here. So. <laughs> Anything? Okay, now it's advancing. Perfect. Thank okay. you. Okay, uh, but it's still in slideshow form. It's it is, still in. But at least it was, you were able to advance it, and we were able to see that. So. Okay. How about? 
How about that? Is it advancing? We see the agenda. I see the agenda. All right. That's still not advancing. No, nope, um, there it's advancing. Yeah. How about that? Yep, yeah, we're on your mission page. Okay. Uh, seem to have a hold up when I try to make it the whole screen. Um, is this acceptable or is this going to be problematic for for you, for you all? Uh, when I fine. try, I can sure? see it. It's fine as long as it advances, Dr. Barris. I think we're yep. okay. So okay. right now we're on the DH integration activities page or the organizational Got chart. It. So I'll go back okay. to the org, org chart just to finish the thoughts around the historic okay. Sorry of, about that. Of Runnymede. No. Uh, probably on our on my side um, we have a, a historically filled that ALF with um, uh, majority government payers um, especially Medicaid uh, long with those with Medicaid long-term care insurance it's been a incredible resource for our community however um, hasn't really given us enough uh, uh, of, of a margin to do the sig you know significant infrastructure investments needed in buildings that are 100 years old. Um, so, you know, we are facing some sustainability headwinds uh, when it comes to our assisted living. It would be a real loss, and I really tried to play that up when, when applying for some congressional funding. Um, real loss for the community because we, um, uh, kind of like the hospital, we run it very lean, but it's a, it's a much more affordable assisted living option for folks in uh, Windsor County and Sullivan County um, uh, environs around here. Uh, so hopefully um, this will continue to stay on the org chart, and, uh, but we, we may end up having to repurpose some of that assisted living for some workforce housing or some other creative options down the line. Our uh, in integration activities are um, uh, far flung throughout uh, and widely dispersed uh, throughout the organization, and it's everything from finance to to IT. Do want to make a note that our we we had planned to be up to our eyeballs with a complete IT integration with Dartmouth Health uh, over the course of um, both fiscal year 22 and into 23. This was going to be a significant investment by us as well as Dartmouth Health. Um, and would have required a CON submission on our part. We had already done a lot of legwork there, or Dave had. Um, because of the financial challenges faced by the system now, that work has been put off um, uh, probably for 12 to 18 months. So we'll probably again be talking about it at this time uh, ne next year, and we'll have a, a, a CON to submit uh, around that time as well. So we will continue with our current um, IT platforms, which we actually um, uh, enjoy. <laughs> They're mature. We've been in the same uh, revenue cycle in clinical EMR software for nine years now, uh, and it works for us. But uh, true system integration will require us to go onto the Epic EMR and adopt all of the uh, uh, financial and HR platforms that DH has. Our current service lines are, are listed in this slide. Uh, the red ones are directly supported by uh, uh, providers from Dartmouth Health. Uh, there's one correction to note here is our, our last bullet, the neurology service line. That was a, a, a neurologist who actually trained it at Dartmouth uh, Hitchcock uh, for her advanced fellowship, but uh, uh, we ended up hiring her full time. So it's actually a Monoscutney provider doesn't need to be read there. But, um, you know, mo most of the providers you see here, even the ones that are not read, have spent some clinical or training time uh, at, at Dartmouth Hitchcock. So um, uh, the, the long tentacles from the system um, uh, continue in our neck of the woods. Just a quick comment on our uh, inpatient patient satisfaction scores. These were uh, downloaded, I believe, just the day before uh, this presentation was due to be submitted to you all. Uh, we continue to do really strongly. Our, our inpatient experience scores are uh, very high. In the last couple of years, we've um, had, uh, you know, seven or in seven or eight out of the ten modalities surveyed um, for hospitals in Vermont, we've had the highest uh, 
uh, scores continue to exceed the national and Vermont average in, in almost all of these. We, we uh, focus on these uh, uh, surveys and our performance on them. Um, I, like most um, uh, uh, docs, especially inpatient docs, uh, used to discount some of this because it takes, uh, you know, it really takes a team. It takes a village to have strong satisfaction scores. You could be doing the best job in, in the country in nursing, uh, but if your hospitalist is a jerk, you're going to have a lousy score. Your hospitalist and doc could, in in your nurse could be the best team, but if the unit clerk and uh, you know the pharmacy tech or the, the experience they have in radiology is suboptimal, then the whole the score for the whole stay um, goes into the tank. But I think we've tried to create that relevance across all of our staff and and have everyone thinking of that patient satisfaction is driven by every every uh, staff member in the hospital, whether they're uh, touching patients or not. Uh, I think at this point, I'll uh, transition off to Dave for, for a number of slides, and then it'll be uh, back to me. Dave, you can, you can just tell me to advance as you need it. Okay, great. Um, so good to be with you folks again uh, this year as uh, I, I discuss with Sarah Lindbergh. This will be my 25th year of uh, BISCA slash POC slash Green Mountain Care Board. So we've we've hit a milestone this year. Um, so our, our rate increase, uh, our price increase is uh, we were 12th of the 14 hospitals um, and, uh, you know, ranked sixth out of the eighth, uh, lower being uh, higher being better. Uh, for this year's submission, um, you know, our NPSR FPP increase is, is a blend of uh, volume uh, plus uh, net uh, receipts on the rate increase. And, and obviously, the uh, utilization is the driver here. I just wanted to mention I greatly appreciate the requested change in charge uh, chart. Um, I think it's a good way to look at things over time. And um, you know, obviously, we have a, a, a fairly uh, low uh, average through those years, and uh, we hope to continue that going forward. Um, obviously, our lower end of the range is a little bit better uh, than some of the other, but it's really good to see some of the uh, other facilities being pretty tight year to year uh, on their rate increases. Um, we won't talk really uh, about the next three slides. Um, you get they're part of your your standard materials and i don't think they add a lot of value to this conversation but uh certainly uh we can talk about that um at the end with questions um so if you maybe just jump to the cash flow uh joe yeah one uh, one or two quick points on this one um you know essentially if a cash flow is is functionally break even for, for year to year. But um, two things to point out uh, that you've probably heard uh, in other presentations as well, that uh, you know, we're, we're all behind in our capital investments. And um, you know, we've really made a concerted effort even in FY22 to try to catch up on some of that. But the throughput, the bandwidth, the supply chain delays, uh, all of those making it very difficult for us to properly properly uh, capitalize additionally uh, uh, this cash flow statement is uh, far less than ideal due to the uh, uh, expected investment returns next slide Joe so volume um, this is probably the most robust uh, estimating uh, uh, that we've used uh, we kind of grabbed what was normal prior to covid uh, we did look at what we budgeted and what the actuals were during COVID, and but we put the most amount of weight on how we're running, uh, you know, FY22 year to date and projected. Um, obviously, where we're appropriate, we tried to uh, uh, look at anything that would be uh, limited due to COVID, um, whether it's uh, patient processing or or whatnot. Um, but uh, we're really working off how we're progressing at this point of recovery uh, through FY22. Um, 
I guess the, the most important thing uh, the, on this slide for me is that uh, when we uh, submitted our budget and uh, completed our budget in June and sent it in in early July, uh, we had expected that acute days uh, would continue on the trend that we had been experiencing up to this point in this fiscal year and over the end of last fiscal year. Um, we've had uh, three months now where the acute census has actually diminished and uh, we've had lower than expected inpatient surgeries not that we do a lot of those but our n is so small it's it's fairly material to us um, but we've seen a um, a reduction of acute to acute transfers from dartmouth and uh, we've also seen some of the other uh, regional facilities uh, being able to take what they were taking before. So we actually made a little bit of a bet here uh, on acute days and uh, right now we're not gonna we're not gonna see that trend unless something uh, changes over the next couple months. Uh, really no risk with swing days or uh, inpatient acute rehab days. those are functionally flat. Uh, outpatient, um, couple things going on here um, as COVID has uh, continued to uh, progress. Uh, we've we've uh, seen a, a reduction in emergency room visits. Um, laboratories obviously going down with less testing. People are testing at home now. Um, and uh, infusion, we, we had really, this is kind of how small we are. Uh, we had one patient uh, who moved the needle significantly on infusion and um, uh, we do not anticipate that that patient uh, will be continuing to receive these services uh, through the following year. Um, uh, the operating room is essentially flat which might be a little bit of a bad bet sitting here in August versus June. Uh, respiratory therapy we've had a lot of staffing issues and so we've uh, kind of pushed the staff more towards inpatient to make sure that uh, we're solid in that area. And so we've had to cut back on, on some of the programs that we run on the outpatient side until we get back to full staffing. Uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, uh, all going to be down from uh, where we're annualizing now, uh, mostly through staffing issues. Um, and uh, that's, you know, we have limited capacity, you're down uh, we have one speech therapist and we were contracting for a point two. that point two person uh, uh, retired during the uh, great retirement of the pandemic. And so uh, we have a, a, a reduced capacity and those things have to be pushed towards our, uh, our inpatient acute rehab business because uh, that's, that's our flagship service and uh, that service cannot be rendered without those folks. Uh, clinics kind of all over the map. Um, we've uh, um, initiated a, uh, a walk-in uh, clinic aspect for our primary care here in Windsor. So uh, that'll take a little bit away from the ER and uh, hopefully we'll be increasing our volume in the uh, uh, internal medicine uh, primary care area here in Windsor. Uh, OHC increasing significantly, mostly through staffing changes psychiatry going down. Um, you know, we made uh, a commitment several years ago to uh, attempt to build a psychiatry program here, uh, which we were successful at doing. Um, but uh, we have a, uh, a part-time provider who has also retired and uh, uh, obviously uh, recruitment is very difficult in that area. Uh, oncology down, kind of commensurate with infusion to some degree. Um, Pain management, uh, we're decreasing by 50%. That is a, a service that we uh, rent from Dartmouth. We have a provider that comes down and uh, Dartmouth is short on pain management providers and uh, has pulled back uh, that pain management provider to their, to their shop. So that will uh, definitely put some pressure on. We've got a couple uh, potential solutions for that uh, and we budgeted uh, for that, but uh, it'll be down from uh, where we have been operating at. Physiatry, we have a new full-time provider that started uh, at the beginning of this fiscal year and their practice is building and they are working 0.2 FTE more than their predecessor. 
Um, ophthalmology, uh, we've been recruiting in that area for a couple years uh, without success. And uh, our ophthalmologist is on the glide path towards retirement. And so that accounts for the 15% reduction in that clinic. Um, and neurology, uh, as Joe mentioned, uh, you know, we've uh, committed to that uh, program and, and that, uh, that clinic continues to grow as it matures. Relative to the payers, uh, we don't expect any material or significant changes in our reimbursement rates. Um, Medicare, uh, predominantly uh, cost-based reimbursement for us, as you probably know. Uh, we have uh, budgeted for sequestration to come back into play, which brings us from 101% of reasonable cost down to 99. Uh, we do receive PPS reimbursement for our inpatient rehab unit, um, and it's clearly going to be less than inflation. Uh, and the provider fee schedule also expected to uh, lag inflation. Uh, Medicaid, uh, we really didn't expect much change uh, at the time of budgeting from Medicaid, and typically they lag inflation pretty significantly. Um, I would say the most important thing on that uh, on that slide is is uh, really uh, what we're experiencing right now is pre-authorization issues um, with the commercial payers asking for certain services to be pre-authorized that uh, are rendered within the emergency room and quite frankly are, are fairly small potatoes in the scheme of things, um, which is probably going to lead to uh, uh, additional write-offs as some of those are just logistically impossible. Um, these are relatively new uh, issues that have come up over the last few months, and so we, we have not gotten back to the table for uh, contract negotiations, which will probably start next month, and uh, will be addressed at that time. Additionally, we're having a lot of inpatient uh, pre-auth issues with some of the Medicare Advantage uh, payers who are being incredibly stingy um, on approving days uh, that are clearly uh, medically necessary. Uh, UHC in particular. So uh, we're requesting an overall 4.7% uh, uh, gross price increase, 5.5% uh, on the inpatient side. Uh, generally, uh, we're a little bit cheaper on the inpatient side uh, than the average and a little bit more expensive on the outpatient side. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll take less of a, a, an increase there. Uh, and professional services, really anything uh, more than 3% is, is really vapor revenue. So uh, our weighted average is 4.7% for, for Maniscotti. Uh, no adjustments or provider uh, uh, practice transfers or any changes in reporting or accounting. Uh, other operating and non-operating revenue, you know, we've, uh, I, I, probably have irritated uh, Joe every year um, that he's had to share this experience with me that uh, 340B um, in our ongoing dependence on other operating revenue to make a margin every year is, is more than concerning. Uh, we have come to that point for 340B, as you've heard from other uh, hospitals, uh, the manufacturers have uh, limited our, our ability to um, maintain our historical uh, levels of funding. Uh, I will tell you that uh, over the last three months, that has kind of come to a head here at our facility, and that reimbursement has literally dropped off the table. Um, I expect that will be um, our experience next year, unless we throw money at it with FTEs and some uh, information system changes, uh, we'll probably drop off the table far more than we budgeted uh, to probably to the tune of two or 300,000 annualized. So big, uh, a big concern there. Um, our blueprint funding, we are receiving reduced reimbursement. Um, I think there's some additional uh, uncertainty going forward on that funding in general. Um, so that's very concerning. Uh, the rest of it, quite frankly, is, is standard fare and probably not significant changes from prior years. Um, expects, uh, expenses, so salary, wages, benefits, um, 
you know, we uh, put in a 3% uh, rate increase for all employees effective 10 one 22, 2% of that will functionally be merit or, or cost of living. Uh, additionally, uh, there'll be 1% for uh, market and or replacement costs. Um, and and for I haven't really heard this mentioned in a couple of other presentations I've I've watched, but replacement costs is today I'm paying you know $40 an hour for this uh, um, uh, this position. Um, they leave, and uh, the going rate to get somebody in the door is 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 45. So um, you know we'll be trying to look at those markets and uh, the replacement costs for critical positions, and uh, we'll be trying to manage that all within 3% for the year. Um, we actually have a fairly favorable renewal uh, expected for our health benefits, uh, and we're hoping to migrate uh, fully onto the Dartmouth Health uh, benefit platform. Uh, we have 3% for retirement budgeted. FTEs, uh, budget to budget, are essentially flat. Um, we have six FTEs that are, are tied up in COVID-related screening and things of, of that nature, um, uh, but the rest is is pretty much flat. And um, I know that there's been a lot of discussion regarding how we budget travelers, and essentially what we do is, and we've done this for years, is we budget for the FTE salary and benefits, and uh, um, we, we budget uh, a differential between the cost of salary and benefits for an employed position uh, versus a traveler uh, based on current trends. Um, so uh, that, that is booked in, in uh, contracted labor. Um, so supplies, if I were to throw an average out for what we built, um, is, is probably 8%. We have some things that are uh, running um, at double digits, some things that are running to three to five. Uh, if I were to assign a number, a weighted number, it would be about 8%. Uh, and, and, uh, and then obviously tweaked by volume as well. Uh, purchase labor is up. Some of that is additional integration. Some of that is the traveler uh, factor. Um, purchase services are going up 8.6%. And these are the allocations from the uh, Dartmouth Health System uh, to Mount Escutney and um, utilities, no surprise, up 21%. Heating fuel being the big driver. Uh, depreciation also increasing 11%, uh, generally driven by uh, um, trying to catch up on, on some capital investment and to uh, catch up on age of plant degradation. Um, and just a little editorializing on, on our expenses. Um, we, we have been working kind of a multi-year project with across the health system to align around a comp and benefits uh, philosophy for all system members. Uh, one that's not driven by, you know, everyone doing the same position, every hospital gets paid the same. Uh, there'll always be some discrepancies amongst critical access hospitals, community hospitals, academic health centers on what we can actually afford to to pay, and it has proven to be pretty a pretty challenging project. Um, you know, most of the hospitals are in New Hampshire, uh, we're in uh, in Vermont, um, and you know there there are different we we have different guardrails. I'll, I'll say in putting together comp and benefits, and what 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 we have seen is with our attempts to stay within a certain range of system comp and benefits, we end up unintentionally putting a fair amount of pressure on our neighboring hospitals uh, in both uh, New Hampshire uh, and Vermont. So uh, we uh, expect that pressure will uh, continue as the need for recruitment of nursing and technical professionals just continues to get worse. Um, and Dartmouth Health has to respond uh, to those pressures, uh, the, the 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 cycle will continue. The the larger players will raise comp and benefits. We'll try to stay close or within reason or within what our comp philosophy is calling for. And then, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes we we end up setting the new market or DH sets the market. We are scrambling, and other other institutions are are feeling some of the pressure. We we expect that. Uh, uh, 
uh, unfortunately, that cycle will continue. Sorry, Dave, back to you. No, that's fine. And and uh, so kind of some other uh, kind of big items um, that uh, have come up, I'm sure, in a number of your other uh, presentations. Um, if we, I always look at what are the big things that are driving margin. And, you know, we, we had projected to make a 1.7 on operations this year. Uh, we're probably going to come in around 1%. And um, uh, really, uh, no change from the narrative that we submitted to you folks. And we're budgeting a 1.7 percent mar operating margin for for next year. Um, some of the things that are affecting us uh, this year um, are the ED borders, which um, I know that you're um, more than familiar with. But I, I thought I would give you a, a little bit of a, a perspective on it. You know, uh, we get paid for, as a CAH, we get paid for um, provider downtime within our emergency room. And based on the uh, the diminishment of, of downtime, because we have folks staying for so long because we can't get them placed uh, down at the retreat or, or, or wherever appropriate facility, um, we expect to lose somewhere between sixty and eighty thousand uh, dollars in reimbursement from Medicare alone next year uh, on that item. Uh, additionally, uh, to put some perspective on it, we've had uh, if I were to look at only ED visits that last more than twenty four hours from the time they get checked in to the time they leave the building, um, we have uh, two hundred and two patient days out of 365 covered with continuous stays. Um, normal downtime for us pre-pandemic was uh, 30 to 35%. Um, obviously having an ED is a condition of participation for a critical access hospital. Um, but uh, right now, uh, or last year, uh, 21, um, we had 15% uh, downtime. So our downtime of having no patients in the ED has been cut in half. Um, the cost lost on that, you know, in, in probably total is somewhere is around uh, uh, $200,000 to $300,000 a year, easy. And one of the things that, you know, we appreciate the extra $200 that uh, the Medicaid program would like to uh, send us uh, for, the, for these types of patients. But the fact of the matter is uh, that probably doesn't do much than uh, cover our cost to get that authorized in about an hour worth of nursing care. So um, appreciate, you know, appreciate the help. Um, probably really not going to make a significant difference to us. Um, you know, 200 uh, days. Our, our average length of stay for people who stayed more than a day was 3.3 days. And our longest last year in the last 12 months was uh, 13 and a half days uh, in the ED, uh, being unable to send them anywhere. Uh, similar problem on the subacute uh, border uh, inpatients. Um, we had, uh, we estimated 2,000 uh, border days over the last uh, uh, year. And uh, generally, if we're able to get them on Medicaid, um, um, then we're probably going to get about 150 bucks a day. And our, our costs uh, probably are close to uh, $1,500 a day. So um, we're not even covering costs on that. And uh, it leads to a pretty extensive write-off. Much of this is driven by our inability to place uh, to sniffs. Most of the sniffs in the area are capping Medicaid percentages. We've talked about this in prior presentations, uh, where uh, Genesis and others are are lowering the percentage uh, of Medicaid patients that they will have in their census. So, uh, the VNA struggling uh, throughout the pandemic. Uh, we have a lot of patients coming in right now with some very complicated social issues. And um, discharge planning, I meet with the care management folks each and every week uh, to go through. Uh, we typically have, uh, you know, anywhere from five to seven or eight borders at any given time. Um, and uh, it's, it's very problematic. I, I, I don't know that we have a good solution for it. We have a very aggressive program here to uh, get people out and into the most appropriate setting. Uh, but uh, uh, we've got more than our hands full. And then the, uh, you know, obviously traveler, locums, contracted labor, you guys have heard all about that. Um, the great retirement. Um, 
kind of when we looked in, and responded to some of the questions regarding turnover rates, um, really what, what I, the conclusion I've come to looking at the data is that our turnover rate really has been better than many facilities uh, over the last uh, two years. Uh, the problem is our fill rate is not keeping up with our turnover rate. So as a result, our vacancies have, have, have trended up uh, despite doing what we can for, for wages and uh, benefits and doing good recruitment. Um, inflation and supply chain, you guys have heard all about that, so I don't feel that there's any uh, point in belaboring that, but if you have any specific questions, certainly uh, we'll answer them as best we can at the end. All right, we'll, we'll um, <clears throat> transition uh, back to me for a while. Uh, I, I, I feel like in the last number of years, we've, um, uh, I, I don't want to say lucked out, but it's been fortunate that some of the focus by of the Green Mountain Care Board and the uh, healthcare advocate has been around projects that we've been deeply engaged in um, uh, uh, concurrently. Uh, so it makes um, summarizing what we're doing a, a, a little more straightforward. Previously, we, we had been, continue to do a lot of work around uh, substance use and misuse and the, the, uh, the, sh the slight shift in focus toward uh, equity um, kind of stays right in our, our wheelhouse. Um, so we, we've been uh, focused on this work uh, on our, uh, in our community health department and within the community health department, our Mount, Mount, uh, what we call MAP, the Montescotney Prevention Partnership, uh, devotes significant resources. Uh, to both studying and increasing health equity in, in our communities. Um, for, for 21, uh, probably uh, about $112,000 coming in in grant funding uh, to support some of that work. We do trainings in both the community and for our own uh, workforce. Uh, this can be trainings in trauma-informed care. Uh, we've had at least half of our staff uh, uh, gone through a, a trauma-informed care uh, curriculum. Uh, we uh, have a cultural competency curriculum covered in 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 our some of the yearly compliance modules that we do for every every staff member, uh, and it's part of every orientation for every uh, new employee that we bring uh, into our hospital into the health center. Um, we have a specific role um, as designated by both. Um, the state and the the prevention partnership, and that's as the prevention center of excellence uh, for our region. Um, and this is uh, particularly work around uh, reducing disparities in substance use rates and increased protective factors for use. Um, so we've built dashboards at the community level that allow us to track indicators on on where really the stress points are. Um, uh, the youth risk behavior uh, survey helps to inform some of this. And then we try to, uh, as, as we uh, uh, give out sub awards to various groups, we try to highlight or try to align those stress, those stress points that we're seeing with the funding support to nonprofits in the area uh, to support the work. So that may be restorative justice programs in Springfield, for example, LGBTQ plus and other parts of uh, programs in other parts of uh, uh, Windsor County. Um, and, you know, a lot of this work doesn't necessarily translate very well to bulleted slides uh, and on our, our HCA uh, questions as we, the, the responses to those questions that we submitted. We, we provided a pretty extensive review of everything we've been doing uh, in our communities over, over the last a uh, couple years. As the group that that uh, uh, generates the most data, we sharing that data I think is, is critical. Uh, the Windsor JEDI Committee, and JEDI stands for Justice, Equity, Diversi uh, uh, Diversity and Inclusion, uh, have invited our Montescotney Prevention Partnership uh, to present its uh, YRBS data on health disparities and on uh, protective factors in the Windsor County Schools. Um, we have focused on substance, uh, substance use and, and mental health, LGBTQ plus students and students of color. Um, this led to a presentation for the Montescotney School Board uh, back in December, and those conversations with our JEDI, Jedi Committee and the School Board 
um, uh, continue. We, we uh, have a, a strong role within the, the school districts uh, that we serve. Um, and again, we, we try to uh, share the data with them so that um, uh, it's both for both awareness and program development at schools to, to help our kids. Uh, I can continue on uh, with uh, some of the wait time works. Dave and I can do this um, uh, together. Um, what I'll say as an uh, overriding theme here is that uh, anywhere you see non-primary care or specialty-based work, cardiology, gastroenterology, oncology, um, pain medicine, uh, urology, uh, you'll, you'll see more extensive wait times. Uh, these are limited time providers that we are either securing through locums or predominantly from Dartmouth Health. Um, and uh, they come down to us, we fill their schedules, we could fill more of their schedules if we had more of them, but um, Dartmouth Health is suffering with provider staffing woes uh, just like we are. Uh, we've made great gains uh, in, in primary care. Uh, we are uh, as close to fully staffed as we'll ever be on the provider side with primary care. There's been a noticeable um, shift and a volitional shift from having a really physician heavy clinic to one that's more of a mix of physician and associate providers. And now our, we have more associate providers than we do uh, physicians in our uh, primary care clinics. Um, and that is a response to the workforce. Those are the, that's the workforce that's available to us. Um, so we, uh, we can't just put our heads in the sand and hope for uh, uh, physicians to, uh, 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 you know, uh, materialize and, and want to come work in a, a rural healthcare practice. Um, but there are some, you know, real outliers here. Uh, pain medicine is one that's only going to get worse as DH pulls back their, their pain provider. Uh, rheumatology, we've had a part-time provider uh, from the Yale New Haven system that had a vacation house up here for years who's been coming up uh, one or two weeks, uh, one or two days per month for many, many years, and he's approaching retirement. And uh, The rheumatology recruiting market is uh, just horrific nationally right now. We're not training enough, and there's just a not not enough um, internal med uh, medical residents going into rheumatology. So you can see some real brutal wait times uh, there. Uh, but uh, we've, we, we're recruiting in both of those uh, uh, sections right now uh, and just coming, uh, facing a lot of headwinds uh, as we try to improve those numbers. Uh, we're, we are uh, one of the few, if only primary care practices in the region that are open to new patients. Uh, <clears throat> There was a, uh, a recent uh, series in the Valley News, our local paper, about the difficulty in finding primary care. So we we're happy to share that we um, were open to new practice, uh, new new patients. A little bit of a little bit of a wait list to get in, but usually within a month we can get all the medical records obtained, um, uh, evaluated, and then have people assigned to the appropriate provider. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add on to that is probably what you've heard elsewhere is that, you know, uh, we don't we don't have a lot of uh, downtime for our providers. And so therefore, any 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 uh, methodology to address this, you know, um, is going to lead to additional costs and revenue, which I, I don't know, you know, you guys are going to have to give us the green light on that before we can uh, a recruit and and some of them functionally, you know, to get another 0.1 or 0.2 cardiologist is is not going to happen. Um, and and we're onesie twosies. I mean, uh, it's the the rheumatologist is very important to our practice here. Our medical infusion program um, generates a fair amount of revenue, uh, provides an important service to this region uh, outside of Dartmouth, and uh, you know we're not going to get another 0.1 or 0.2. Uh, to relocate to the area, so. More wait time data uh, regarding some of our ancillaries. Um, and obviously what sticks out is a 53-day wait time for a non-urgent uh, echocardiogram. I, I think that's an atrocious number. We have been 
working with DH to lower that. We've also tried to come up with our own plan to get equipment and rent a uh, echocardiographer um, that could at least create the studies where we could then contract with cardiology to read them. Um, but that that is uh, uh, that's a sore spot <laughs> uh, for us uh, to say the least. Uh, we are. Uh, in, in anything that we are struggling on the clinical or technical side, we are forming, you know, closer, deeper relationships with uh, Valley Regional Hospital in Claremont. We'd love to get to a point where we're sharing technical staff and sharing the equipment um, uh, to allow for better access and capacity for both uh, uh, Windsor and, and Claremont patients. Uh, that work is ongoing. It's been ongoing for a number of years, and I'll uh, dig a little bit deeper uh, into that in a couple upcoming slides. Yeah, we just, uh, you know, we've been we, trying to get, um, you know, ultrasound cardiac specialist technologist, and we rent that from uh, Dartmouth, as do most of the regional CAHs. And uh, Dartmouth is down several techs in, in their shop, and so therefore that impacts us as well. Uh, normal outpatient ultrasounds, we're, we're actually in pretty good shape, but it's when you need the subspecialty cardiac study uh, that things get dicey. So we take care of our inpatients, number one, and, and then whatever we can do to fill out their schedule on outpatient. But uh, And Valley's in the same uh, position as is Springfield and I believe Alice Peck Day. So well, we, uh, we, we almost got hold of a unicorn about six months ago. Um, who wanted to come work uh, for us and in Valley and had actually filled in as a traveler, both facilities at one point. And uh, we was like, man, if we can get her in, it'll be a beautiful thing. And uh, she ended up uh, hitting the traveler market for, for big dollars. So um, we're kind of, Dartmouth has been very gracious in, in flipping us techs when they really can't afford to, um, but uh, it's, it's not a good plan going forward. And more on, on wait times, we do um, every month in our primary care operations meetings, we review all of our stats, we examine capacity and access, uh, tweak schedules. Uh, the biggest thing that we have done, at least in primary care, is since last November, we did start a walk-in clinic embedded in primary care, which um, has uh, increased capacity substantially um, uh, in primary care for for our own patients and for, and again, anyone that, that walks in, they don't have to be uh, one of our patients. Um, uh, unfortunately, what we've seen is, um, uh, at least as the summer has drawn on, is that the walk-in has become busier and the ED has become busier. With Their original hope was that the walk-in would decompress our emergency room um, and allow for folks to be seen in an ambulatory setting for ambulatory sensitive conditions. And what we've seen is initially there was a definite decompression of the ED, but now both are quite busy. And I think that's mirroring what a lot of other health uh, uh, systems and centers across the state are seeing with rising urgent and emergent um, visit volume. Um, we uh, do everything we can at the, at, at the primary care sites to uh, allow for uh, same day access to their own providers. Uh, but that, that can be challenging and can, can lead to, uh, uh, you know, open, open slots at the end of the day, which we definitely don't want uh, as well. We've, we've restructured primary care so that it is a purely um, salaried position for our docs and our associate providers. There are, there's no productivity incentive we, we have uh, somewhat longer visits than most places. We have 30 and 60 minute visits uh, only. Um, uh, so we're really not trying to hold too many of those uh, spots available. We, we try to have same day providers available and then we have our walk-in in, in clinic for, uh, for overflow. I think we're gonna probably have to expand the walk-in services if uh, the current numbers uh, continue. And uh, for patients who don't want to see their own specific provider, whether that be a doc or, or an associate provider, there's because of the access we have, uh, it's, it's rare that a patient can't be seen that day for an issue that uh, arises. 
there are questions around how we manage referrals. <clears throat> Uh, all of our referrals are electronic so that they can be tracked um, and so we can make sure that the loop has been closed. Um, you know, our, our, the majority of our specialty care is happening at, uh, at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Um, so uh, there are, as mentioned previously, more substantial wait times for specialty services, whether that be GI, cardiology, dermatology. Um, uh, these are these are, are, are real issues, and they, as I mentioned earlier, they they share the same staffing stresses that that we are now. Uh, our our admin staff in the clinic uh, work with providers to triage referrals appropriately. We do a lot, myself included. Uh, make a lot of calls up to DH to say, hey, you really got to see this person and whatever it is. I'm, I'm, I think for my first few years here, uh, I think Dave, Dave would say my only added value was that I knew everyone at DH and could get patients in. <laughs> Hopefully it's moved beyond that a little bit, but we all, that, that, that's part of the, you know, that's, that, 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 that's part of the business. Uh, uh, we are often making calls to get try to squeeze people into already packed uh, clinics uh, and outpatient evaluation uh, at, at Dartmouth Health. Um, and uh, uh, this really ought to be, to be fair, hasn't really changed much uh, during the pandemic or uh, during new endemic times. I think that we were asked for some recommendations. Uh, so Dave, I'm not sure if you wanna uh, take a shot here. Yeah, I, I think, you know, until we're all ready to uh, invest in some of the solutions here, um, in other words, hiring staff and providers and whatever uh, infrastructure costs and revenue that comes from that, unless we're willing to do that, I'm not sure it makes a lot of uh, sense to keep measuring it. Uh, I think a simple measure like what you folks asked for uh, in this year's um, request, I think is reasonable and, you know, I think you can see over time whether it's getting better or worse. Um, you know, if we're ready to address this uh, from a financial perspective, then it may make sense to make that more robust reporting over time. Um, you know, I think it's uh, it's a little bit difficult um, when you're a border hospital versus uh, someone who's kind of uh, landlocked in the middle of the state. Um, you know, for those of us who bump into New Hampshire in particular, um, you know, they feel like going out and getting a cardiologist and paying a large subsidy and they don't need a full-time cardiologist. They just need, you know, whatever, three days, they, they'll, they'll do it because they don't have any restriction uh, on that. So, um, you know, it's a little bit problematic. And I think it goes back to Joe's earlier comments about, you know, coming up with some rational service line alignment within this region, which would include um, across the river. And, and I think that's kind of where Dartmouth is, Dartmouth Health is going. Um, that's certainly uh, a portion of the time we've been investing over the last couple of years and trying to figure out what opportunities are there with Valley Regional Hospital to share uh, staff, technical, clinical, uh, as well as providers. And that may be, that may be a solution for us, but uh, right now we, we really don't have any uh, um, open slots for a majority of our specialists. Yeah, I would I would add that <clears throat> to date our success with uh, Valley Regional in, in in Claremont, New Hampshire, has been in the sharing of senior leaders um, and 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 folks at the manager and director level. Um, I think the Holy Grail is or the Holy Grails are going to be uh, you know joint staffing pools, whether it be nursing, hospitalists, ED docs. Um, uh, technical positions, radio, uh, you know, radiology techs, lab techs, respiratory therapists, and we're, we're sharing, we're starting to share there. Um, so uh, th there's a lot of opportunity, uh, I think, to have a more uh, regional approach um, to this. Uh, some of that, um, uh, some of that sharing, especially at the manager director level, does depend on that hospital coming into the uh, the health system, which is uh, likely on on track. Uh, for some time in the next uh, six months, um, and uh, hopefully we'll 
you know, continue to uh, grow the, the foundations that we've put in place there. So, uh, you know, risks looking forward, um, you know, can't, can't get through a presentation without mentioning COVID and new variants. Um, you know, we have got acute and chronic labor shortages and trying to maintain all of our, uh, all of our pillars of the COVID response, uh, it's been challenging at times. Um, there was a recent uh, letter to the Vermont digger uh, from a, a dissatisfied family member of a, one of our pediatric patients that we couldn't get the booster to. This was one of the newest, uh, you know, uh, 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 approvals in, in June for COVID vaccinations for our, our youngest pediatric patients. And when you're on a electronic medical record, uh, uh, like we are, at least with ours, Cerner, uh, when there is a new formulation of a drug or a vaccine, uh, especially with a vaccine that changes dose and the frequency with which the doses are given, like occurred with this younger age group, um, we need to partner with our EMR vendor to create a new order set that we can then use so that we can safely uh, administer and document the vaccination in all the different places we have to do that. Um, and there was a delay and this poor um, uh, woman was uh, not able to get the booster that she desired in a time that we would have been happy with uh, until the order sets were in, in place. We've since fixed that, um, but it's an ongoing, again, it, it's just a emblematic of ongoing stresses we have to continue all the work with COVID, but at the same time, Keep, keep the wheels on or keep the train on the tracks and everything else we're trying to do. Um, you know, the other huge risk, and you've heard this from every presentation, is around the healthcare workforce. Um, yeah, I, I compare this to Maslow's hierarchy for healthcare. It's like, I can't self-actualize with dedicated staff to do all the cool stuff we wanna do if I don't have the staffing at the bedside to care for patients that need to come in the door. And we're struggling with that. I think it's, um, while we have uh, low turnover rates, um, successful recruiting, <coughs> there's still, um, uh, you know, we're, we're 30, about 30 FTE under budget right now. Um, and that's just open, open positions. So we have more travelers uh, than we'd like to have. I think the reliance on a traveler workforce, the reliance on a temporary workforce has led to some uh, 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 issues and serious safety events that we would we, we have typically performed incredibly well on both at the state and national level. Um, but when, again, a temporary workforce that may not have, be totally bought into the, safe, the, the safety culture and quality uh, uh, measures that we put into place, um, it can reveal uh, kind of cracks in the foundation. So we, we, we need to, th that is a, a real worry of mine. We've kicked off a back to basics campaign across our inpatient units so that all of our nurses, new, old, travelers, longtime stable staff here, ha you know, have the opportunity to take a breath, recenter, um, and uh, focus on um, uh, the, the, the practices and strategies that have gotten us to where we where we are. I know there's been mention of of the the new uh, patient care tower at, at DH. Um, yeah, that that's going to be a draw on resources. Um, certainly, uh, as part of the system, we've engaged with the nurse residency program with local nursing schools. We are uh, <clears throat> there isn't a day where we don't have a a, a ton of learners. Yeah, both either in technical positions or in the nursing staff uh, moving through the organization. So we're hoping that the, the, for the folks that we serve as a training site for, we'll be able to keep some of them and they'll like to stay at a, at a small uh, uh, place uh, as opposed to the uh, rollicking uh, academic center. Um, but it, that, that's going to be a stress. There's no way around it. And I'm as much as stressed out as I am over it, I know that DH nursing leadership is just as stressed out because they've got to staff these beds. 
Yeah, I'll just throw in one thing I thought was interesting uh, in looking at our travelers last week, working with my staff, doing some analytics on it. Um, we had two and a half traveler FTE October 1st of this year. We're currently running at 11 or 12. So our traveler issue has grown over the last nine months. It hasn't been a pandemic issue in its entirety. We kind of kept it together for uh, uh, the first couple years, but really this year, uh, since uh, October, we've gone from two and a half to to as high as twelve. Uh, <clears throat> another risk to consider um, is uh, related to our ACO engagement. When the when this slide deck was submitted to the Green Mountain Care Board, we hadn't heard whether our request to remain in the two core programs. Um, I'm sorry, that should be for 23, Medicare, Medicaid. That request hadn't been um, processed by the uh, One Care Vermont Board of Managers at the end of last week. I was notified that that was approved. Um, that is a slight reduction in our participation because we had um, uh, been previously in both Medicare, Medicaid, and the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield um, programs. Um, you know, we this are, the level of our engagement in the ACO has been an ongoing stressor <laughs> for me and the management team uh, with our board of, of trustees. They uh, we have a very engaged, uh, sharp board who who questions the value of everything we do, knowing that we don't have a number of, of value of uh, revenue generating clinical service lines and uh, knowing that we. Uh, can't uh, uh, volume or revenue our way out of any problems. Uh, they they question everything that that we do, and um, the the there was really no enthusiasm to increase engagement beyond Medicare and Medicaid uh, for FY '23. Um, and part of that has been, and I've said this for for years at this presentation and and others and at the system level. Uh, you know, all of our specialty care, all of our expensive care occurs elsewhere. Uh, we're, we're a small critical access hospital. We hew very closely to what we think a CAH should be doing, um, you know, with focus on primary care, general surgery, uh, some real, uh, any specialty work is deeply rooted in the need to support primary care. Uh, so, you know, we don't have orthopedics. We don't have a uh, any other specialty surgery program outside of ophthalmology. Um, and when you look at our, our where our spend is in our health service area, it's all orthopedics, psych, and specialty care, all, all occurring at DH or elsewhere. And virtually all of our regions of orthopedic care um, outside for some that is staying in Springfield, almost all of that care happens in New Hampshire. And we're, you know, fundamentally on the on the hook for that. So it's always been kind of a ten, some tenuous decision making when it comes to our ACO work. That said, we we have been part of Medicare and Medicaid uh, for all but one year on, on Medicare and every year for Medicaid. So uh, the, the, uh, that work will continue in, in 23. We've already mentioned wage pressures. Um, housing is seems to be this immovable object um, that uh, despite a lot of efforts by our organization, our leaders, and serving on, you know, every housing coalition <laughs> for 50 miles in any direction, um, until the cost of of, of building uh, affordable and workforce housing drops, uh, and there are more private public partnerships moving in to do this work. Uh, one of which I will say, DH has been, uh, DH and the Mascoma Bank. Have have done incredible work. They've actually started a, a fund a fund to help support builders who want to focus on workforce and affordable housing. Uh, that all came from our corporate council work on the Vital Communities nonprofit that uh, I work on. Uh, we're hoping to move the needle, but uh, I, th I think our housing uh, struggles are going to be generational in nature at this point. And Dave and I have both both uh, already mentioned the uncontrollable inflation that hopefully is leveling off at this point. We've mentioned the work that we're doing uh, with Valley Regional. Uh, we expect that work to uh, uh, 
uh, increase uh, in its momentum to increase over the next uh, six months. Uh, we're work, we are working to stabilize and grow a urology program between us and, and uh, uh, Valley Regional to meet the need. Uh, there are long wait times for any urology uh, care um, at, within the system uh, right now. Uh, but I would add that, um, again, we have no, uh, no other immediate plans to add to the current portfolio of, of service lines on the Montescutney side of the river. Um, not much to say here, um, except our budgeted uh, upside downside risk for calendar year uh, 23. Um, that was a, a number that was uh, tolerable uh, for our uh, board of, of trustees and the Dartmouth Health uh, Board, my bosses uh, as well, uh, felt that that was uh, reasonable in the time of uh, significant financial headwinds. Um, so this is a direct response <coughs> to um, uh, questions about our value-based care uh, participation. Um, and again, tough to tough to put in a, a, a bulleted slide, but you know our organization's desire was to stay within the very well-run Medicaid program that we find to be um, uh, uh, predictable uh, uh, year over year allows us to plan appropriately. Medicare still remains a, a, a concern for us. Um, I uh, have not wavered much from my uh, notion that um, the Medicare next-gen ACOs are, are, are not the ideal vehicle for healthcare reform, especially in, in rural uh, uh, healthcare settings and, and particularly in critical access hospitals. Um, especially critical access hospitals with uh, operating margins that oscillate around zero year, year after year. Um, uh, downside risk, um, uh, when, when, when I discuss it at uh, national meetings uh, through the AHA, is, is just something that is, uh, you know, most uh, rural CEOs in, in other parts of the country find shocking or, or untenable. I'm the I'm the chair elect of the Rural Health Services Committee for the AHA, and I I, I share our, our our journey both in the next gen ACO and how we're planning for what version 2.0 of healthcare finance and delivery reform looks like. And uh, um, uh, most of the responses are along the lines of, "Wow, that sounds very interesting. Glad I'm not you." <laughs> um, uh, but you know that's us, and that that's Vermont, and I think we're going to figure it out. Uh, I I believe that there's openness across the state in trying to figure out what uh, what version 2.0 of of this process is going to look like. Uh, I'm just always on the record of saying one 1.0 has been a little bit rocky um, uh, to this point, and but but we're, we're we are still uh, actively engaged in trying to make it better. Um, so this, this was a, a tough question, um, and, uh, I, I, in our organization, it, it is challenging to tease out what, you know, part of the PHM funds, uh, or the pre-funding of the blueprint or it is, is actually going into a specific bucket of, well, that's covering you know, that bit of comp and benefits for that community health team nurse or continuing care nurse when those folks have been subsidized by the Blueprint for Health for years. Um, they, we've never been fully subsidized by the Blueprint for Health or for the other complex care management work that we have had in our clinics. Uh, and those are nurses, care managers, social work that have been there for years, we've always had used the funding that we've gotten from from Blueprint, from PHM funding to actually reduce the subsidy that the hospital has already have in place for all of our community health team and community health section uh, efforts. Um, the, the pandemic really hasn't had much of uh, an impact on our complex care management. It's been going on uh, for years. 
Um, our overall bandwidth um, uh, in primary care, we actually probably had more when we were when volumes dropped substantially early in the pandemic to focus on care management. And now it's kind of more right sized. But what we've seen year over year is our hops, our hospital subsidy for all of these programs hasn't has increased. Um, I would say I would I would not say that our blueprint dollars or the ACO payments, um, you know, fully uh, subsidize that work in, in, in any uh, in any fashion. Um, and Dave, do you want to add something there? Nope, I think you nothing really of value unless there's a specific question. Uh, so uh, more follow up on value based care uh, participation. Um, you know, the only thing that, that really we have seen as we've moved in uh, from pandemic to endemic phase, uh, at least for now with COVID is we have seen our paramics change a bit. We have, uh, there are more Medicaid patients um, uh, coming through the door. In our adult populations, we are uh, focusing still on our core bread and butter, general internal medicine work, focus on preventative screening, colo, um, uh, work around diabetes and, and pre-diabetes. Uh, you know, where we have seen the stress of the pandemic really has been in our pediatric care teams. Uh, we are, we have built a, for a hospital our size, a really remarkable behavioral health team that spans both, both adult and pediatrics uh, clinics, but really has a much bigger footprint in pediatrics uh, to help deal with the social drivers of health uh, with behavioral health, food insecurity, housing, substance use, misuse being our primary targets. Um, you know, our community health teams, our community health department pursues over a million dollars in grant uh, in grant funding each year to help support efforts around family wellness, as well as our work in behavioral health, food insecurity. It's not all just family wellness, but it's the whole portfolio of community health work um, that we're doing. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, that's, that's a lot for us to manage a hospital of our size. The, uh, the impact on Dave's finance team of bringing in that kind of dollars can be um, uh, onerous. Um, uh, so, you know, as we, uh, we, we look at every new grant dollar to make sure it's, it's, it's actually supporting a program that our providers want and will continue to do that. But uh, uh, bringing in those kind of dollars uh, year over year, um, uh, it, it takes a, uh, a remarkable amount of effort um, to, to, to do that job well. Um, so our, our, our providers are, are uh, well-versed in both their uh, One Care Vermont data, blueprint data, uh, practice profiles. Uh, you know, we are tied into uh, our, the Dartmouth Health System with our quality and safety dashboard where they see uh, measures regarding uh, patient access, uh, our, our, our performance against screening measures, our performance with diabetes and hypertension. Um, so th there, there are uh, many opportunities for our providers to see how they're doing and help uh, brainstorm on, on ways that we can improve care of the, of the patients that we serve. Um, and uh, just kind of really, really repeating the prior slide, we, we, we have a lot of data. I, I, I find the one of the best parts of our engagement with One Care Vermont is uh, 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 real-time actionable data on the clinical front. Lags obviously lags a bit financially, but on the on the clinical front, uh, we get um, uh, excellent data and I think an accurate profile of how we are caring for the lives uh, attributed uh, to us by One Care Vermont and the Medicare and Medicaid programs. Uh, it, Again, same thing. We're we're sharing this data regularly with our providers and with our community members. Um, what we have found across the H, uh, at least in our HSA, is that Mount Scotty Hospital and Health Center is doing the the majority of the work around complex care management. We that was kind of predictable, uh, I would say. And but I use that data to to leverage some of our community partners to step up with. Uh, their engagement in complex care management, whether that be our designated agency, our home health agencies that we work with. Um, but what we have found in our experience is that it generally falls to our continuing care nurses in our clinic 
to do the necessary complex care management and, and provide the, the coordination that these patients need. Uh, I've already mentioned there uh, um, regarding settle, settlement information and, and, and where investments of those dollars go. Uh, these dollars go into funding our clinic operations and um, uh, you know, adding to the subsidy that, that we uh, already provide in primary care and pediatrics uh, and covering gaps and funding for some of the programs critical to uh, uh, what we see as mitigation of the social drivers of health. And again, I mentioned this in, largely in the pediatrics and family wellness work uh, that we're doing. And we did not uh, have a, a, a loss uh, in uh, uh, 21 and or projected 22. Um, uh, Dave, you want to comment on our capital budget? Yeah, um, nothing uh, terribly exciting or sexy in this. Really trying to catch up on uh, mechanicals and routine replacements. Um, we have no CONs to be executed during FY23, but we do plan on filing one uh, based on a potential go live of uh, a DHIT platform project in FY24. Um, uh, I know there was some interest in knowing we, we underspent in capital by about 4.5 million, which was about 38% less than what was budgeted for the last couple of years. You know, we're, uh, many of the rooftop units, which are about the least sexy thing we could possibly do with capital money. Um, those things are, are running at almost a hundred percent markup for cost, uh, and install. Um, so we had actually planned to have had a couple done by now, and now uh, the, the, the thought of doing two a year, uh, we'll be lucky to get one a year done, uh, and it will cost the same as two. We just ordered, um, uh, just committed to a project uh, within the last couple weeks, and the lead time on it is 62 weeks. So we've already screwed up that line item on our budget next year, and we haven't even gotten to next year yet. So um, those are those are probably pretty typical of what you've heard elsewhere, and they're no different for us. And then the supplemental data, probably the most controversial response I'm going to have today. Uh, so, you know, kind of I talked to Sarah uh, about it a bit and, uh, you know, appreciate the the info, uh, really couldn't uh, validate this with our own internal data per se. I think that, uh, you know, as it relates to market share, um, you know, we're kind of more driven in our budget process by, uh, you know, our, our own study of where folks are coming from for our existing service lines. Um, you know, we don't advertise or market in other service areas. Um, so we, you know, that market data as provided really was, wasn't very valuable to us, nor would it be. Um, reimbursement, um, kind of, uh, we found some anomalies in the data. Um, I think maybe the data is valuable. We just couldn't determine it as a, a first glance without understanding all of the definitions and the math behind it. But, uh, you know, I offered to Sarah, be happy to sit with uh, the folks and, and kind of go through there, kind of mush some data together for our swing bed and rehab into our normal um, uh, inpatient data, which of course made length of stay and, and some of those things look a little bit goofy on it. So I, I think there might be some value in that. We've testified in prior hearings that from an outpatient perspective, we are very expensive and we've made material efforts as best demonstrated by our rate increase, but also by our price reductions last year. And I actually have another one sitting on my desk now, uh, but it seemed a little uh, self-serving to send it in the week before uh, uh, our hearing, uh, but uh, with another uh, marked uh, decrease that we'll, we will not request that our submission be changed. We'll just, we'll just eat it. Um, so we're making, you know, we're making steps towards that, and 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 I think it is valuable uh, for us as a state to look at that data, and would welcome the opportunity to go through it at a detailed level. Uh, and lastly, um, I know we've already hit most of this already around COVID nineteen impact on us. You know, we we are still carrying FTE COVID specific FTE um, regarding. Uh, 
for things like uh, screening access to the doors, to um, uh, coordination of our uh, activities across the, the health system. That, that's been the same for a couple of years now. I think we're always going to have to carry five or six FTE um, uh, for this for this kind of, of work. You know, we, we have invested in our infection prevention team. We've made hires into our quality and safety team that are uh, we're somewhat uh, motivated by uh, our pandemic response, but uh, uh, that's been a fundamental tenet of, um, of you know, my, my tenure here, um, uh, and that's been investment in quality and safety efforts uh, and growth of, a, of that team. Um, so th th those folks will always be here. That FTE will always be with us. But, the, you know, the, the, the final mention really is just workforce. It's workforce, workforce, workforce. Dave has mentioned the great retirement. Some people talk about the great resignation. I refer to it as the great reckoning. Um, there's just been a lot of folks that have left the workforce and the folks that have stayed um, in the healthcare workforce, they're, they're, they're tired. Um, and I would say brittle. Um, when I'm covering on the acute rehab or in our acute inpatient units as a hospitalist, you know, people are people are just fried. The level of burnout is significant. We've um, we've weathered much of this. Um, we've had historically have had um, uh, quite high employee engagement metrics. Uh, the Dartmouth Health System does a system wide Press Ganey employee engagement survey twice a year, a, a pulse survey um, in the fall, and then a major engagement survey in the in the spring. And we continue to have um, really strong scores. Um, as high in the fall, we we're in the 80th percentile nationally in employee engagement, dropped a bit to the 76th percentile for the spring full survey. Um, but that's that's just due to Herculean efforts by our by the dedicated staff that we that we still have, um, and uh, but I, I always feel like we're going to run to the engagement well one too many times, and it's going to be dry. And, and we are, you know, tiptoeing toward the cliff edge on our staffing right now um, with multiple senior leader meetings each week. Typically, you know, Mondays, a couple on Fridays, where we're talking about do we have enough nursing staff to keep ED beds open to keep rehab and acute inpatient beds open for the next few days. Um, and while we've done a reasonable job in, in, in staying um, uh, reasonably full despite staffing woes, uh, we've seen a bit of a summer swoon. Part of it is there does seem to be less patient volume or less, in, less inpatient and rehab volumes coming to us. Um, but there's also been nurses and other staff providers taking much needed vacations. So um, it's an organization that's under stress right now. I'm hoping that our strong engagement, our, our, our safety culture pulls us through this, but, but is certainly, certainly of concern for all the leaders here. And with that, uh, I will finish up and stop sharing. Great. Thank you both. Uh, really appreciate the candor, appreciate all the information, some really impressive programming you have going on in, in initiatives that was exciting to hear about. Um, I think what I'm going to do is, before we start in with the board questions, is maybe just give us a 10 minute quick recess, little bio break, and a chance to stretch your eyes and also board members to compile your questions. So we will come back at 3.10. Yeah, that's 3.05, sorry, 3.05. Okay, Great. so just a quick 10 minute kind of regrouping and we'll see you all back here at 3.05. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. It looks like we have all the board members back and I see Dr. Paris, I see Dave, wonderful. So I think everybody's here and I'm assuming the court reporter as always is on. Um, so. Yeah. <laughs> I knew you were, fantastic. Okay. Uh, with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to board members for questions, and I'm going to start with board member Lunch. Do Thank I have a you. question uh, from, the, from the court reporter? 
Lisa, you have your hand raised. Okay, I'm going to assume that might be a, a misraise. Uh, Robin, do you want to kick us off? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, hi, Joe. Hi, Dave. Nice to see you. Um, thank you very much for, as always, a very clear presentation. Um, so I'm going to start with a question that I've been asking all the critical access hospitals um, to speak a little bit to, which is, um, could you talk about how some of the higher inflationary pressures that you've seen in fiscal year 22 will flow into your cost report and the timing of that, just so that we have a sense of um, how that will impact things? Yeah, so I, I, I think the, the answer uh, will be similar as you've heard from other critical access hospitals, which will be that, uh, you know, obviously we will submit all, all uh, reasonable costs as Medicare defines them on our cost report. And so the benefit of being a critical access hospital and the detriment are connected. One is when things are uh, getting expensive or volume plummets, uh, we never feel uh, all the pain that a PPS hospital uh, would feel in that circumstance. The flip side of that is when things are great, volumes up, payer mix is good, all those things, we never enjoy the upside completely. So, um, so the long and short is, yes, it, it'll be recognized. Uh, Medicare's fair share will be recognized on the cost report. Um, that will probably uh, not make up for um, the fact that we're locked in for 90% of our commercial experience with current rate, you know, current uh, reimbursement and, and certainly not going to get anything from Medicaid. Does that answer that question, Robin? Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, the next question I had um, was related to the travelers and just understanding what um, assumptions go into the numbers. So you had mentioned, Dave, that um, you're back in October, you're, you were looking at more like 2.5 FTEs in travelers. Last couple of months, it's closer to 11 to 12. I know we've certainly been hearing that also the, the dollar amount, the hourly wage for travelers was very, very high and seems to be coming down. Um, so what I was curious about is, are you seeing, I'm assuming you're seeing that same trend, but it'd be good to know if not. And also, uh, what did you base your budget assumptions on in terms of those dollar amounts and numbers? Okay, so uh, a couple things is we budgeted specific amounts based on the type of traveler. So Got an it. RN versus a lab tech versus a respiratory therapist. And those rates, they do vary pretty significantly. At one point, I think we were up to about two hundred and twenty dollars an hour for an RN. Um, now it's down, you know, buck twenty, buck thirty, somewhere's around in that range. Um, and uh, lab techs, rad techs, uh, and respiratory therapists, RNs is predominantly what we're experiencing right now. Um, RNs being the most expensive. Um, but I, I believe in one of the prior uh, presentations, they they were trending down to 120, 130. That's pretty much uh, what we're seeing at this point as of like kind of today. Um, and then what we do is we just budget the differential between the traveler rate, uh, less uh, salary and benefits for a like position uh, if they were employed. And so uh, I hope that does it. Yeah, yeah. What I was curious is, did so when you did your budget, did you assume it, it was going to stick at like the 120 rate, or did you assume it was going to come down think, more or be higher? Just I think at the time for nursing, we were like 130, 140, um, and I, I definitely can get the specifics uh, for you because we literally line item budget that, and then. Uh, the rad techs, lab techs, RTs are kind of the next level down, so they would be probably 100 to 120 off the top of my head. Great, thank and, you. Know, much that's the housing, which to yeah. Joe, you know, we just had a discussion the other day that uh, one of our travelers uh, for an apartment that uh, uh, that would have rented uh, pre-pandemic for $900 a month is paying $2,100 a month. 
So guess who's paying for that? Yeah. yeah. All of us. Housing is a, a big issue in the state. Um, okay, let me just flip through and check my little sticky notes here to see what else I had. Um, my, my analyst just texted me that, uh, um, uh, so it's kind of the beauty of Zoom, right? So yeah. uh, this, this just in. Um, yeah, so uh, lab techs are, are closer to 90, rad techs are closer to 90. Um, and uh, we budgeted 130 for RNs and RTs are, are in the middle, so. And it's important right. to note that EDRNs, surgical, you know, same to, it could be the range could be 160 down to 100 for a staff nurse on the acute unit. So 130 seems like a safe bet right now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I had a question about appendix one, which is the reconciliation table. And certainly if it makes sense to follow up on this and not speak to it right this second, that's totally fine. Um, the, so the top half of that table is the budget to budget. And then the latter half is the projection to budget. And the part that I was a little bit confused by is I would have expected the rate effect from the rate increase to be the same in both tables since your rate increases what your rate increase you know will bring in what it'll bring in um so i was a little confused by that and i wondered if you could just speak to that or you can follow up if that would make more sense um so just to just to uh are you talking about the uh, uh looking at the title here on these things i have them in front of me these are on the analytics right the five six page it Analytics. is on, and I apologize because I don't know how you get it, but it's it's the appendices that are um, behind the budget narrative. So the first page is fiscal year 23 budget reporting requirements, appendices one to seven, and it's appendix one. Yeah, I don't have that. I'm sorry, I don't have that with me or anything that looks like that. Okay. Um, but I'd be happy to, so what is the, the uh, my my question is in the projected to budget um there's nothing listed for the rate increase and i would have expected the rate increase to be the consistent factor between the budget to budget and the projected to budget since it brings in a set you know sort of a certain dollar amount um, but maybe you could just follow up with sarah um yeah, I'd be about happy to that. That, that yeah i I do I think I do know what that was part of the submission though. We don't have it the way you have it, but right. I, think, I figured it could be something like that as well. Um okay, we already talked about that. About that. Okay. Um so the other question I had is about the blueprint. Um and I was curious about your statement that you're worried about the, you know, kind of the blueprint funding ongoing in part because there's a, the blueprint was asked by the legislature to do a legislative report on how to increase the blueprint funding. So the discussion in the legislature was pretty positive about potentially seeing if next session there might be more money, not less. So I've, so that's what I had been hearing. It sounds like you're hearing something different. I just wanted to uh, learn a little bit more from what you were hearing and what you were thinking. Yeah, I think it comes from uh, uh, three different concerns um, and we're hoping is not a uh, perfect storm. So one, we had a, uh, we had a $340,000 hit to FY22 uh, because we were being overpaid uh, from that program for like two years or something along those lines. And we can go into the reasons why, but it was a, the contractor for the state miscalculated it and uh, we had to take the hit in one Got shot. It. Month Got of May, it. actually. Yeah. Um, and then of course the the ongoing, I think, you know, $10,000 a month going forward uh, hit. Uh, the other part was uh, as we dug down to try to understand uh, what happened in this situation with the state of Vermont, um, you know, we realized there's parts and pieces to this. And I think it was uh, a little bit more complicated than than uh, we understood at the time. So, you know, between the spoke, uh, the straight blueprint, the stuff running through the ACL, right. 
Yeah. Um, so it was like, and then we were hearing things uh, related to the ACO that some of the payers weren't going to play. So you know, we we didn't we didn't cut our budget, but we have there's like an asterisk next to it for us mentally that. Yeah. Um, and if you've heard, you know, I don't think I've heard uh, what you just referenced relative to the legislature actually moving into that direction. I just heard it was talked about, and we all know in healthcare nobody ever wants to pay more. So. Um, we're we're skeptical. Sorry. No, no, don't be sorry. I just wanted to understand what you were thinking. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, lastly, I'm wondering if you could speak to uh, any cost savings or expense savings initiatives that you have uh, ongoing. I know you're part of NIA and you look at supplies that way, but if you could just remind us of those efforts that you uh, are making. Yeah, I think there's, you know, uh, DH has a pretty robust supply chain GPO model, what they've, which they've rolled out to NIA, as you referenced. Um, I think we found some of our biggest savings in that actually on the, the some of the capital equipment. Um, that's where we're really seeing large chunks of savings. Um, um, additionally, you know, we continue you know, Joe and I kind of laugh about it. You know, we're, we're worried about workforce staffing. Like how many times have we mentioned that in the last hour and a half? And and at the same time, we're still sitting in position control once a week as senior leaders. We have an opening in registration. Are we filling it? Um, you know, we're having a, we have a third shift nurse RN. Are we filling it? Um, and, nego and our HR folks negotiate with all the travelers coming in. So from you know that perspective, I think from a staffing perspective, we're we're doing as much as we can, and uh, you know looking at alternatives like critical shift pay uh, to incentivize people to pick up additional shifts as opposed to paying the traveler. I think you've heard that in probably other presentations, um, and and trying some more creative ways of 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 plugging some of the staffing holes and some things we've just plain gone without because we can't we can't yeah. get anybody in that regard um so you know it, it's it's all the things that we've historically done at mount of need to try to you know bend bend the the rate increase and bend the cost curve uh we're still doing uh even in the midst of all of this and um i wish you know i, I just think we're being largely less successful at each of those things than we have been for the last, uh, you know, pre-pandemic years. <clears throat> Would you say that's a fair assessment, Joe? Yeah, and Robin, I'd add that, um, you know, there, there is gonna be some consolidation of the leadership team um, with the Valley Regional work. Um, there'll be some savings on, on both campuses uh, there. Um, and uh, but yeah, I mean, coming from a place where we're we've always been counting all the paper clips, um, <laughs> it's uh, you know we're still doing that, but the paper clips cost more. <laughs> so. I hear you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, those were the questions that I had. Thank you. Good to see you. You as well. Great. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Board Member Pelham. Well, good afternoon. Um, it's good to see you gentlemen again. Um, I'm struck by this conversation. Um, it's clear that you both have a lot of commitment and affection for your institution at the hospital and your community. And uh, um, people don't um, put themselves through the kinds of tr trial, you know, that um, you've had on the ground in the last uh, two or three years uh, without that kind of uh, a uh, heart to uh, heart beating uh, about your community. So thank you. Um, wanted to ask David how his golf game uh, has held up all these years. <laughs> My golf game is horrible. horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Me, mine is non-existent. Um, so uh, I wanted to, I, I don't have much here. I mean, uh, uh, I almost got to the point of saying, I don't want to waste people's time asking questions um, because um, you know, the top side data is, is to me, uh, just very compelling that if you look at, uh, you know, your, uh, NPR FFP, uh, growth rate from 2021 through 2023 budget, um, it's at 2.8%, um, for all, for all hospitals, it's 9.2%. 
So you're 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 beating the pants off your peers. Um, for total operating expenses, uh, your amount of scrutiny is growing at 5.7 percent. The statewide average is 7.6 percent, um, and you're in for a relatively small charge amount. But I, I think NPR FEP it's about 10 percent, which is where all the other hospitals are. So you're definitely um, generally an outlier on the more conservative side, and uh, I didn't want that to go unrecognized. Um, Thank you. The, the only key question I had, and it, it probably uh, it follows up on Robbins about travelers. I, I couldn't follow the bouncing ball through the doc through the document um, in that there was this line on the income statement that says um, other purchase services dash travelers and and the line all the cells on that line are not filled um, in the reconciliation document um, that Robin uh, was was referencing in the appendix it says in table two that um, there was a three hundred and seventy six thousand dollar increase in travelers between uh, uh, um, 2022 and 2023. Um, but then there was a 629,000 reduction in travelers uh, between projected 2022 budget and 2023. Um, so I just couldn't find um, a number that that kind of kind of tied it all together, you know, that I could look at it and say, here is what they've been spending on accepting your methodology. Um, this is what they've been spending on travelers and it's what they project to spend on travelers to get a sense of how big a bite that is, you know, um, you know, out, out of your total expenses. Um, th there was on, uh, there was a line right next to the teacher's line on the income statement that said, um, other operating expense. And, uh, it was in the 14 and a half to 15 and a half million dollar, um, range, but I didn't think that was your, Travel expense. Um, yeah. So anyhow, I mean, when you're looking for answers for Robin's questions, just tag, tag, tag that one on it. Um, and my final issue was um, last uh, October, um, uh, the um, AHS submitted to us this workforce report, um, and it had all these recommendations from this work, this committee that was put together. Um, they came to the board and presented, and I think we generally felt that it covered all the bases. Um, and uh, so there's, I have a list here of um, all the advisory group. It's, it was an advisory group, all of their recommendations on workforce, just on health care workforce. And I'm just wondering if at the ground level, whether you are seeing things happen, um, uh, you know, all the agencies are engaged here. Uh, you know, AHS, the uh, Agency of Commerce and Community Development, the Department of Labor, DFR, DIVA, you know, they all have uh, related recommendations. And I'm just wondering if you're seeing anything on the ground because all of these things were supposed to unfold in generally 2002, uh, which is in this current budget year and the 2023 budget year. And I'm wondering if we should be anticipating any improvement in, in you know from from those efforts joe you might you mind if i start and then you can kind of yeah. add color or whatever yeah um so just to kind of back up so so all of those numbers that you quoted relative to the travelers are correct our actual is way higher than what we budgeted for the year we're currently in and next year we're budgeting far less so um, why is that? Because we're actually budgeting that we have people employed versus contracted help. And we're only budgeting the differential, which is why we left that, uh, that staffing year to date line um, blank uh, on our submission. I should read that. <laughs> good, you're good. You're good. Um, so that's, that's why, because we, we have always done that before travelers were even an issue. We've done that for literally years. We bet on we bet on ourselves, and then we hedge a bit. So right now we're running at eleven to twelve um, uh, traveler FTEs, and we we didn't uh, 
we figured we'd have some percentage of that, but not all of that. So even the differential that we built into our budget is betting that we're going to do a better job uh, in the market for recruiting and retention. And then as far as the, the, the other initiatives, I've never seen that document. Doesn't mean it wasn't sent to me and I kind of filtered it out of my inbox. But um, um, certainly I think the things we're seeing here is, is you know, there's there we're just not building a workforce and a lot of people are 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 you know are are, are hanging it up and um so you know we've got a lot of stuff going on which didn't come out in our presentation relative to working with area colleges whether it's for a uh, bachelor's rn or it's to get an x-ray tech uh, uh built so to speak um we've spent a lot of time with those and i i feel like it's it's we're all fighting over the same people because there's not enough people to go around and whoever's doing the best job self-marketing um, and recruitment retention. We just had a great job in the finance area um, that, you know, it's a professional job uh, and uh, we had it posted for six months. Um, we got two horrible resumes. And uh, the only re and we filled it with a great person. She actually starts tomorrow. And uh, um, the only reason we filled that job was a uh, friend of a friend of a friend uh, recommending us. You know, Dave's a pain in the butt, but he's actually a good guy to work for. And and so we were able to kind of network our way into that opportunity. And then we didn't scare her off during the interview process, and uh, we did a good job um, landing her, so to speak. And uh, she'll start tomorrow, and it's it's a great thing. But I mean, it was a, it was a great deal of effort for literally one position that fought four years ago. I think we probably would have gotten 20, 25 resumes for, and people have been excited to come, and 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 here we are. Uh, we had to recruit her from well out of state well out and, of state. And, and Tom, I'd add a, a couple uh, points. Uh, about, <clears throat> about eight months ago, I kind of repurposed our CNO to really focus most of her time on workforce development. So she went out and built relationships with all the training programs, more around nursing, MAs, LNAs, um, uh, to kind of grease the skids and make us a, a training site for all those programs. And, and I found that you're most successful when you grow your own. Um, these are, but those are, like nursing training is, is well established. The, the uh, LNAs and CMAs are more manageable, easier to bite off for younger folks or folks just entering the workforce. Um, so I feel like we're making significant progress there. What we haven't focused enough on are in the technical positions. And really the, the training and the cost of training for respiratory therapy, lab techs, PT, OT, um, those are structural issues where there has to be, you know, federal, state partnerships to, you know, lower the cost of training. I, mean, I, I can agree to pay for anyone's training, but I can only do that for a handful of people. It, it, it shouldn't cost 30 grand to become a respiratory therapist. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's crazy. Uh, um, so we, while I think we're moving the needle um, through the outreach efforts that we're doing um, on the nursing side of things, it's the tech side that uh, we've kind of missed the boat on. We have to kind of have to go drag back to the drawing board there. <laughs> we never had travelers in the tech positions before. Now, every department, has got a traveler. And as, as Dave said, you know, we're talking about 90 bucks an hour for a, a traveling rad tech. That's, um, that's unsustainable. I mean, we, we, well, I, I know, I uh, thank you for that. I, I know that my question wasn't well developed It's one of these things that just hit me in the last couple of days is, is I found this thing going through the files and it's pages and pages of broad and loan repayments, increased scholarship funding, revisit tax incentive proposals, explore opportunities to expand family practice. And, and these were all assigned to state agencies by basically the Agency of Human Services. And I'm just wondering if folks on the ground are seeing any activity in that uh, ballpark, but, you know. I would say uh, no, not, not in our neck of the woods. It's always been in, our, all our success so far has kind of been internally 
generator. Yep. Uh, and, and Dartmouth Health has done a nice job with Colby Sawyer in Andover, New Hampshire, to repurpose what used to be a small, struggling liberal arts college uh, in uh, New London, New Hampshire, sorry, um, into more of a health sciences university. So, um, but, you know, as they've graduated all these nurses, um, the Boston hospitals have looked north and said, hey, we have a new training ground. So, and now, you know, my wife was a nurse in Boston. They didn't hire nurses just out of nursing school back back in the day. You had to have a few years of experience and then you'd be hired by the general, the Brigham, what have you. Um, but now they're taking them right out of training. So all those nurses that we are now training locally are feeling the pull and, you know, a 70 bucks an hour non-traveler salary at a Boston hospital versus, you know, 40-ish up here, which is even, which can, can even be a new nurse. It's, it's, it's really, a, yeah, it's, it's tough. <laughs> well, thank you for persistence, for your persistence. <laughs> and I'll pass the ball back to Jess. Thank you, Tom. Board member Walsh, you're on deck. Thank you, Jess. Um, and hello, Joe. Good to see you again. And nice to meet you, Dave. Um, just a couple areas that I wanted to explore more. Your um, JEDI training and uh, trauma-informed care. You're the only facility that we've met with so far that um, it has included justice in, in this approach. It's usually been equity, diversity, and inclusion. And so you seem to be a little bit more um, at the forefront of, of this type of thinking and uh, the only place mentioning uh, trauma-informed care, and particularly with the stresses on our our community coming through the the ending of the pandemic, it, it's um, there's been a collective trauma, right? Mm -hmm. That that people have um, been through a lot. So I really appreciate that, and I was just um, wondering if you'd share some of your thoughts about um, the the relationship in your minds about. Um, those initiatives and um, your budget. How do how do those things tie in with the spreadsheets when you're when you're thinking through um, our guidance and and requests? Uh, how do these come yeah. together in your minds, John? That's a, that's a really good question. I mean, historically, all our community health efforts, again, because they've been uh, non reimbursed by traditional payers we go out and get grants um, and significant grants, both from private foundations um, uh, and, and also from the state. So, uh, you know, we've all had this long-term success in our prevention work, our substance use and misuse and alcohol prevention, tobacco, et cetera, uh, through the Monoscotney Prevention Partnership. So we've, we've had that as a foundation that we've been able to build on. And it's, it's, it is um, it's not as hard to to put a different lens on that work to look at substance use and misuse in kids by filtering by BIPOC communities, LGBTQ plus. It's, so we actually get some actionable data that way. We've had, we've actually had some very reassuring data too. If you look at some of our youth risk behavior survey data, um, I'm not sure if it's because of our intervention or not. I I think it's too early to say, but but the, the number of kids that describe being listened to and recognized in their communities, despite being BIPOC or LGBTQ+, uh, is actually just a, just a hair below kids who don't identify in those communities. So that, that, that's a great thing uh, to see. Um, but, you know, we, um, again, because this stuff is, isn't, you know, isn't reimbursed, we either have to, we have to figure out internally, what's the subsidy that we can afford, right? And we've tried to keep that in the two to $300,000 range uh, over the years and man try to manage to that. Um, and then make up the rest by, um, uh, you know, working with foundations. And, you know, when, when we look at our charitable donations, the, the money that people send to us, a very, very small amount is un, unrestricted. I mean, you know, that's like the annual fund responses, 20 bucks, 100 bucks, 50 bucks. It's all big dollars out of 
uh, some of the local foundations um, that 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 help us. Which in in that work, those funds are restricted toward um, family wellness program, uh, our substance use work, uh, our prevention work. It's it's so it that that's kind of how we build um, the budget. We just know that we're going to have to come up with some subsidy that we try to keep manageable and and go from there. Dave, do you want to comment? No, I think the only thing you you know I th I I mean when when your CFO is taking uh, trauma informed care classes, um, <laughs> you know that's probably a good thing for everybody. But um, you know part of the reasons I I sit in some of these things is to make sure that you know that we're com we're following through on the commitment for the deliverable, and that you know these things are attended and we do keep the attendance and they are required uh, if you're a clinical person especially and. I think we've put good things in place to ensure we're getting the maximum benefit out of it, as opposed to, you know, we get to check it off and tell the Green Mountain Care Board about it. Well, it's it's nice that you check it off and get to tell us about it, um, but it's also pretty remarkable that you're doing what you're doing, right? There aren't, we don't hear a lot of people telling us about the, their CFO um, going through trauma-informed training. Um, and, and I think just looking forward, with uh, the sustainability work in, in the future. So much of what we're seeing places where um, all payer agreements have not lived up to their billing or um, ACO led efforts haven't um, held up to what we'd hoped they were doing. They've kind of fallen apart on some of the equity things and learning what we can about our population and then designing are, uh, better tools to meet their needs earlier to keep them healthier. That's what we've always been after. And so um, the type of work you're describing, I think is really at the forefront of um, you know, evidence-based policy, if you will, and, and where things are going future-wise. And the fact that um, the way that you're doing it is through donations, I think is an important thing for um, people setting policy and for regulators to understand that if we believe these things are going to have impact, they need to be funded. Yeah, and, and um, I, I do just want to be clear, we're, we're very, as an organization, we're still very early in our DEI journey, um, as I think a lot of health uh, systems in, in Vermont are. Um, I should note that you know, health, health does have. Me, can a, I just ask everybody to mute themselves? I'm getting some feedback. There we go. Dartmouth Health does have a significant commitment. They just hired their, I was on the search committee for their first VP of DEIB, um, who is great. I've just been appointed to the AHA's Institute on uh, Diversity and Health Equity. Um, so I'll be serving on that role nationally for a, a, a couple years. So the hope is that we uh, will have the opportunity to bring more back um, and share broadly. Um, uh, you know, the AHA positions are often more in a listening role than anything else, but uh, I think there's enough momentum here that um, we'll have some tools that we can use. That's terrific. And um, as we move forward with that, one of the big lessons coming in from the policy perspective so far is that, um, we should be stratifying our analysis of what's happening, um, but uh, predictive modeling, incorporating some of these variables, race, ethnicity, those, those tend to, to um, pull our biases forward. So the predictive models um, don't work as well, but certainly stratifying our analyses to see where there are differences is a good thing. And, and I really yeah. applaud your work there. I wanted to ask um, a question, one final question about workforce. Um, do you have a sense of where travelers are coming from? Where are they traveling from and then landing in our hospitals? Um, I think it, it depends. I wanna say in broad strokes, we get tech positions from the Midwest, we get nurses from the South. <laughs> Uh, in the summer, and then they return in, to the south in the winter. Uh, and but that's that's kind of it. I, I don't. Uh, what what I'm not seeing is I'm not seeing a lot of Vermont plates amongst 
travelers. Uh, and I know there was a concern that, well, I'm going to get a traveler that's coming down from Northwest, you know, uh, medical center to come down and be a traveler for us. I, I, we're not, we're not seeing that they're coming from further afield. Um, and we, we could get more exact data on that from our HR folks. That I'd be interested, but that's yeah. been my sense, you yeah. know, talking with, with different people. And I've just, I've wondered, um, again, as we're thinking, um, regionally, sustainably, um, if it wouldn't be worth exploring having um, a state-grown uh, traveling unit. You know, when COVID moved through, it didn't hit the whole state all at once. There were pieces that needed more care providers for a time, and it, there were ups and downs. And I, I just... Um, over the last few days, listening to um, folks talk about workforce, um, I just wonder if there isn't a, a way to have um, almost a mobile team, not that the team would go everywhere, but you could sign up to be part of this team, that you'd go work someplace temporarily, then work someplace else. And it would be um, a feature for people who are interested in that, that, um, might be helpful. So we're we're taking care of ourselves, not having to pull people from far away who then ultimately leave. So, so I, I'll I'll say that uh, that is really hard. Health systems haven't even been able to figure this out. So DH and UVM, right? We always say when we're <laughs> proposing integration that. Oh, we're going to develop a staffing pool, and it's, we're going to be able to send people around. So we we have a system nursing staffing pool, um, but we're not all in the same EMR, uh, and you know you they tend to go to wherever place is closest to where they already live, <laughs> which again could be could be a feature as opposed to a bug, or depending on how it's framed. Um, uh, but it's been it's been incredibly hard to pull this off, even in a smaller health system as opposed to a, a, a state when we i'll use an example when we do our like mass casualty planning and yep. we're getting pushed well you should open a place down at the you know in the old windsor armory and like no i would rather load up my my boardroom conference room with gurneys and have my own people down there than have to rely on National Guard or Medical Reserve Corps, all of whom played very important roles during the pandemic. But I just, I'd much rather have things under my roof with people that know the know the system. And uh, but so it, it is a challenge. I think it's a it's a good thought as long as it is designed, like I said, as a feature, but not a not a bug. So we can you know do it do it with a lot of thought. Yeah, it would take a lot of thought and a yep. thinking regionally. Um, yep. statewide rather than locally. Uh, well, um, thanks for your thoughts on both um, topics, the how the uh, JEDI work influences budgets and the needs there and workforce. And um, that's all I've got this afternoon. I'll pass it back to Jess. Thanks, Tom. Hey, thank you, Tom. Um, and, you know, I'm going to echo the thanks and um, for your clear and thorough presentation and a lot of the work that you're doing on equity. Wow. Really impressive. I just have a couple of questions. Um, and one is the question I've been asking every hospital. So really trying to understand how a change in charge translates into an effective rate change, uh, you know, on the ground felt by commercial patients. Obviously for every hospital, it's different depending upon their portfolio of, of payer contracts. So I'm just wondering if you can give us a sense of uh, the historical relationship between change in charge and what the effective rate might be and then what to some degree, then what does the 4.7% change in charge translate into? Yeah, I, so, you know, uh, for all payers, you know, 4.7, you know, functionally cut it in half, two, three, five is the overall, uh, what we would receive, right? And then from a commercial only perspective, there's, there's two ways to look at it, one of which I don't like and one I do. Um, so, 
you know, if you look at it in terms of how we report to you folks and how we bucket everything relative to net revenue, then the realization is more along the lines of 3.2%. And that's mainly because of how bad debt and free care get reported uh, uh, from us historically util utilizing your tool. So uh, that considers bad debt and free care. Uh, if I just say as a percentage charge, not thinking about who pays the deductible or out of pocket or whatever, then you know we're getting uh, 3.6 out of the 4.7 as a as a general. Uh, it's pretty close. Yeah. Pretty close. Okay. Does great. that make sense? That's, totally, and that's really helpful for us to understand. Um, so I really appreciate that. Uh, my next, you know, topic area really is just the wait times, and I really want to thank you mm -hmm. for sharing all of that data. I know some of it is hard to look at. You know, I'm sure when you're seeing some of these days rack up into the hundreds, it's obviously not a place you want to be. And I recognize that recruitment and retention are, are big drivers and workforce issues are big drivers of that. Um, this was our kind of our first go at trying to collect this data in this way. And we, you know, every hospital submission now gives us a baseline to, to, to at least measure progress. And so we really appreciate your sharing of your data. Um, I noticed that you didn't provide data on referral lags. I'm assuming that's because it's challenging to capture the date of a referral. And so therefore you can't track that referral lag. One of the things that I'm hoping is, as I listen to you talk about um, potentially moving to Epic, at some point in the future, whether that might be a feature, you know, the IT changes necessary to track those uh, referral lags would be a, a, an important part of that, you know, mm -hmm. of your data ask there. We hear from providers how frustrating it is to, to not know when an appointment is made. Um, and obviously patients do too, or to be waiting for just an appointment to be scheduled. So in, in my mind, if we don't start measuring these referral lags, we don't really know there's a problem when we can't start fixing it. So recognize that IT and EMRs and all of that may be a hurdle for you right now, but in the hopes that when you move to Epic with DH, that that might be something you can track. Do you think that's a possibility? Yeah, so so we, we had a lot of internal discussion about that. And, and if the referral lag is the measure between Dr. X calling for an appointment for specialist Y and, and how fast that gets booked as opposed to when it gets booked, like what date the patient is seen, right? That's the wait mm -hmm. time that we presented right. was how far out for the third appointment, right, uh, to get in. Um, the referral lag here is actually near zero uh, for right. our internal providers. And, and um, you know, the narrative we provided you know, we do look at those, they get uh, electronicized. I don't know what the right word would be. So if we get a call from an external provider who's not on our system, whether it's Dartmouth or Valley Regional or Springfield or wherever, um, you know, those are put in and they are looked at daily here. So our okay. referral lag is near zero, even though we're not really measuring it. Um, I think you know, if we say that's something we want to look at next year, I'm pretty sure we have the capacity to do it. It's just not been set up because that's not been an identified problem for us. Yeah, We're, we've been more that. worried about third, third, you know, third available. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I would say that that um, varies across the state. So I think that there are some significant referral lags um, across the state, and so it's really welcoming to hear that you that's not an issue for you and that's one of the reasons you're not tracking it but um if it's might not get seen for 200 days but we'll get you we'll get you in the saddle yeah. today right so i guess that jessa that's my question so are, are it, when you're referring to referral lag um we're i guess i'm i'm, I'm trying to figure out what the, that means? we can get we can get the data um but is it, are we looking for a measure of how bad it is to get someone into a specialist at DH or at UVM uh, versus like someone calls and they want to get neurology with us or physiatry or some of the other, you know, thinner slice right. uh, bases that, that we provide? I'm trying to, because I think we can, well, yeah, the issue epic integration would help. Yeah, yeah, no, some context here is that we heard in our, um, the wait times inquiry, we heard we had focus groups with primary care providers largely who would make referrals, 
and wait weeks and weeks and weeks to find out when their patient's appointment would be scheduled. And then that appointment is scheduled, and then it could be three weeks, three months, six months after that. But the referral lag refers to the time between a provider making that referral and the appointment actually being scheduled. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. We heard a lot of angst from primary care providers not knowing, and particularly when they felt that there was an urgent visit need, not even knowing when that appointment would be scheduled. So it was a big backlog. And I, you know, we recognize that there is a significant, you know, COVID has had impact. There are, you know, w workforce issues. There's a lot going on. And so, but just to start tracking that, because to some, in some areas of the state, the visit lag, right, which is when the appointment is scheduled to when it actually happens, may be a significant underestimate of the true access issues. Mm -hmm. If people are waiting three months to have an appointment yep. even scheduled and yep. on the books. Yep. So that's Agreed. that's what we were trying okay. to ask and get a handle on in um, in this. And it sounds to me as if that is not something that you face, that you're able to quickly turn around uh, and schedule appointments based on the referrals that come in within a day or two, which is completely reasonable. It's yeah, I, in, internally, I would say internally, the answer is yes, Dave's totally accurate. There are a handful of departments at DH that are, they get the referrals and they, they tell us we will process this as soon as we can and we'll reach out directly to the patient and then you know we we start negotiating we start horse trading like well i'd really like to know too and uh and then i was all right well who's the attending today i'll just call that person um and which you hate it's, it's a, such a time suck but that's still right. what 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 we do and i'm sure it's the same up north as well appreciate that i think it may yep. depend on whether you're an independent provider or a provider within a larger system yep terms of your ability to, to to grease the wheel there and get folks in, um, which is trying, something we're trying to figure out. Yep. Um, so my, my last just request is that if there's anything, you know, uh, any known or likely changes that you're seeing since you submitted your budget or even since this presentation in the next couple of weeks, uh, changes to federal or state payments, relief funds, any unexpected increases in Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement, anything like that, if you would just follow up with Sarah um, in an email that was just a standard request we've been asking everybody. So no question there, just the request. If anything material changes, we be helpful for us to know. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to our hospital finance team just to see if they have any questions. Hi, it's Russ standing in for Sarah today. Uh, no questions from the hospital finance staff. Okay, great. Thank you so very much. Um, then I'm going to open it up to the HCA for their questions. Thanks so much, Sharon Holmes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, good to be with you again this afternoon. Hello, folks from Scutney. Just to, so Sam Peich, um, health policy analyst from the Office of the Health Care Advocate or the HCA. Um, just a couple questions from us. Uh, I want to also recognize and appreciate your response to the health equity questions that folks have already commended you for, but add our voice to that. Um, and particularly want to call out the collaboration with the school districts. I think that's pretty unique and innovative approach that really shows you're informed um, from a social determinants perspective. I haven't seen that from other hospitals that we've heard from so far, so I want to particularly commend you for that. Um, I want to focus on, on page three of your budget narratives. First question, you wrote, quote, the growth of Medicare Advantage plans continues to reduce the benefit of critical access reimbursement, and there's always a delay in Medicare Advantage plans recognizing these costs. Could you please elaborate on the growth and how long these delays typically are for recognizing these costs? Sure. Um, so a couple things. Uh, so FY21, uh, we'll just use that as as the uh, the fiscal year for the example. Uh, ended 9:30 uh, of 21. We file um, our cost report for that year by February 28th of 22. So a few months later, and that's kind of driven by the feds. They give us the due date, and so we submit that. And then Medicare scrutinizes that initial filing. And somewhere around late April to early June, usually the middle of May, um, they say, hey, we've accepted what you've submitted as generally reasonable pending detailed audit. 
and we're going to recognize 80% of the receivable or payable as filed. And then we, we get that information and it changes what we get for our per diem or our percent of charges from Medicare. And then at that point, we take that document that comes in from Medicare, the intermediary, and then we forward it to all the Medicare Advantage plans. And then they, they have, generally speaking, 60 to 90 days is a couple of outliers, but 60 to 90 days to implement that in their system. So what I'm saying is functionally, the costs for September 30th, 21, are probably not recognized until August of 22. So we've, we've lost the better part of a year, uh, assuming that the general trend of healthcare is things get more expensive, right? And okay. this year may be being more critical because of the higher than usual inflation rates. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, next question. So you talked about a fair amount today and in your narrative about the lack of evidence benefit from participating in the all-payer model programs. I'm curious if you're thinking around that changes at all in regard to UVM's decision to absorb or parts of OneCare or all of OneCare into a population health services organization, and if that influences your participation in the future or it's too early to tell. Um, I'll start with probably it's too early to tell. Um, I would love, um, <laughs> I better be careful with my, my verbiage here. Um, I think that we've done a, a, a reasonable job with cost control that is totally unrelated to ACO activity um, because of just of our regulatory structure. If you look at the bending of our cost curve, it's because Green Mountain Care Board uh, uh, oversight of our budgets. And I don't believe that One Care Vermont efforts have made a significant difference in either direction there. And again, I don't think that's a function of of One Care Vermont, I think it's a function of Medicare Next Gen ACOs in a rural environment. Um, so I think a, a statewide population health service organization would focus on the things that the providers I think really care about, and uh, and and probably um, and maybe that's a close partnership with the Green Mountain Care Board from the financial side of things, because we, as we know, value is quality over costs and outcomes, right? Um, we, 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 under, we understand that, but right now the water's too muddy for me to say, well, one care did this or one care did that. I can say that the care management model has not proven to be widely successful outside of anecdotal stories that get rolled, put into slides and shared at lots of meetings. Um, but I haven't seen population health changes. Some of the work that we're doing, we're not going to see change, and it's it's going to be generational. Like our family wellness program, which is a terrible name for a really for a full wraparound program for newborns and their families down here. Well, I'm, I'm not going to know until I get my workbench one report 10 years from now that shows I've got less pediatric kids down at the retreat getting inpatient psych care and less of a Medicaid dependence for their families. Um, so I would like a disentangling personally of, of the population health work from the finance work, just because then I'd have a better, I'd have more opportunity to know which is working. Because uh, I can comfortably say that the Greenmont Care Board has bent has bent the cost curve. We haven't fixed everything, but it's it's bent uh, in a in a more beneficial direction. But I do not think the the population health or the complex care management work um, has moved the needle as much as we would we would like. And so I you know I think version 2.0 of this is prob probably probably um, going to be more along the lines of a. A, a global budget, and I don't want to go into global budgeting because it means different things to different people. Um, but once we agree on a definition, I think it, it's something that'll be more easily um, uh, regulated. Uh, performance can be can be monitored closely, and then a, an entirely different population health services group um, uh, to look at 
I think statewide uh, utilization, practice variation, best practices, et cetera. Um, so the, that idea, the idea of, of UVM taking a, a larger role um, doesn't uh, frighten me, doesn't make me less interested in um, uh, engaging uh, in this work. And in fact, depending on what we do on the financial side could provide more clarity um, for everyone, for all of us on this call right now, right? I can see four people on the screen. I think we'd all have more clarity with a little disentanglement. Dave, any any thoughts from you on that? No, I, I, I think that's entirely accurate. And, and I, I think part of the, the mantra here has been, you know, if we do the right thing reasonably well, it'll all work out in the end financially. And it's not that we're naive, it's, it's you know, we've taken great pains uh, to do a lot of this stuff before One Care even existed. I mean, this has just been a way of, of living for us. Thanks so much, really appreciate it. Those are all my questions. Back to you, Chair Holmes. I thought I'd make it by four, but not quite, 401. <laughs> <laughs> close enough, close enough. And I would just, you know, I wanna add that um, I appreciate that those comments, and I think that the work that we're doing in Act 167 is going to be really important, and that you know your efforts um, in your region are, will be really informative in thinking about how you know how do you think about regionalization of care, how do you share services, how do you think about appropriate site of delivery, and and all of that. So I, I, I hope that we can turn to you as we start to engage in that process and, and gather some insights from you. I think it'll be valuable. Um, all right, well, with that, I think I'm going to open it up to public comment. So if anybody has any public comments, they're welcome to raise their hand in the, using the raise your hand function in Teams. Okay, not seeing any hands raised. If there's anybody on the phone that would like to make a comment about the Mount of Stepney budget, Feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, not seeing anybody on the phone or hearing anybody on the phone. Um, so thank you very, very much, Maniscotney team. Really appreciate your time today and all the efforts that you're making to serve your community and, and keep costs contained. As you said, this is one of the lowest rate requests that we have in the state and that's most appreciated during these inflationary times. Um, so that is it for today. The board will be back online Wednesday at 8.30 to hear from uh, North Country and Gifford. So that is it for us. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion from okay. Tom to adjourn. Second from Second. Robin. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Hearing none. All right, we have unanimous approval to adjourn for the day. Appreciate again. Dr. Paris, Dave, your time and energy and passion for your community. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll see you all on Wednesday morning.